Okay, this is a continuation of our biographies of Paul uh, episodes, and this is going to be asking the question, what is the 14-year mystery period of Paul's, uh, th that he has no accounting for what he's doing in 14, for 14 years? And this derives from his statement in Galatians 2.1, then, then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, and I took Titus along also. So we'll see, <clears throat> we'll see what that's about. Um, and he also has another account where he says three years after something, he then went to Jerusalem. So he has uh, uh, two trips, one after three years and then one after 14 years, he went up to Jerusalem. They could overlap. It could be the three years is within the 14, uh, but you could also read it. It's three plus 14 and it's 17. So it's not clear. Here's what Watson Mill says in Acts and Pauline Writings, Mercer, 1987. His first years as a Christian spent in Arabia are a mystery. Three years after his call, Paul went to Jerusalem to visit. He saw Peter and James later after 14 years. Is that more years or 14 years from his Damascus road? This is what's unclear. He returned to Jerusalem for a meeting often referred to as the Jerusalem Conference, Galatians 2.1. You have to know Galatians is dated to 47 AD by scholars. So if you subtracted 14 from that, you'd get 33 AD, which is approximately when Paul is thought to have had his Damascus road, of ex road experience. So basically he has his Damascus road experience. He goes to Jerusalem to pray at the temple. He, he, he beelines it back to Jerusalem to, to, um, to see the apostles. He meets Jesus in a, in a trance in an ecstasy he's having while praying at the temple of Jerusalem. He tells him to go away. You'll see, we're going to cover all this. Going to tell him to go away. Go go to the Gentiles. The, the apostles aren't going to believe you met me. So that's how it ends in Acts 22. But then we pick it up in Acts 9, and he's going to go to Jerusalem anyway. He's going to go outside of the temple and go see the 12, but with Barnabas's help. And he doesn't seem to say anything, and the 12 don't treat him very, uh, like, there's no statement from them at all, approval or disapproval. So a very neutral uh, response there. And that's it. And then he's apparently gone, maybe until another three years, and then maybe 14 years on top or 14 years overlapping. So it's unclear. And that's where this huge gap of the mystery period, what's Paul doing in this time period? He has no, no entourage or no following when he finally encounters Christianity. He finally embraces what he said happened 14 years earlier, what happened at the road at Damascus. So now this this is what's the disjunction is you know if he had this amazing experience what's he doing all these years about it and so most of the Christian scholars are going to see or Christian commentators are going to say he's he's studying he's learning he's 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 not yet evangelizing so that's okay because he's studying and learning he's having all these revelations so we'll see how they they uh, provide cover for him for this 14 year gap. And I want to show you how other people describe this period, uh, just so we can get a flavor. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I don't even know who he is, but he's summarizing what he thinks this is all about. Those are the silent years. So they're either mystery years or silent years, were years of preparation of our Lord on the human side for the ministry that he, Paul, was to perform. And then they try to reduce it to seven or eight. So he's going to be of the view that you maybe can subtract a three from the 14, you get 11, and then maybe you can make that a little smaller. So Paul's seven or eight years or more, how long they were, we're not absolutely certain, but they were a good many years, may have had some connection with the discipline of God that the Lord wanted to put him, Paul, who is to be the great apostle of the Gentiles through. This does not mean, of course, that he was not useful at all, but it was a necessary thing for him, even though he was useful. There is some reason to believe that when he was in Tarsus, he did carry on some ministry. So they're suggesting things that they don't know anything about. Again, it's a complete mystery. And, and I'm, I'm going to say is that actually may be an important fact, meaning that we don't know what he's doing for 14 years. So he's had this most amazing experience with Jesus, he thinks. And yet, most of the time, he's not spending visiting the apostles to get to know them. He's doing everything he can. He admits in Galatians to avoid them. He doesn't. He wants his revelations are superior. And we're going to read his quotes to see what motivated him to spend 14 years away from the Jerusalem church and ignore them. 
And then, uh, and then Dr. Johnson offers a possibility of, of what might be the reason that Paul isn't at Jerusalem. Perhaps also there is a more public reason why the apostles spent six or eight years away from the land. After all, Paul was too divisive a character. He was the one who had advanced in Judaism beyond his contemporaries. So he's so smart. He was the great defender of Judaism against the newly rising Christian cult. Okay, And so for this one upon whom they depended on for the defeat of Christianity to turn Christianity, that would provoke them much more than some disinterested third party or some third party in whom they were not interested turning to Christianity. So it may have been that he was too, thought too divisive. So he's making it sound like maybe the 12 didn't want him to be around and sent him off. But if you read Paul's writings, that's not a real plausible reason. So again, we're, 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 there's a bit of speculation here, but we're, we're getting there. We're going to start figuring out maybe, I don't know, we'll, we'll keep reading. Another pro Paul article, uh, and so I like listening to them because you can see they're worried about something. They know having all these years of nothing happening is not a good thing, and they have to fill it in and color it in like a coloring book. The consecration, and they call it a consecration period. He's actually being made more holy than before. The consecration or setting apart is the time that the called person spends in preparation for the ministry. So now this is like he's a proselyte. In Paul's case, there was a period of approximately 10 to 12 years between his calling and beginning of his ministry to the Gentiles and his first missionary journey. So you notice how they try to shorten it. It's either 7 to 8 or it's 10 to 12. And they don't like the number 14. Um, during that time, he spent three years in the desert of Arabia, being taught by the Spirit of Christ, Galatians 1, verses 11 to 17. So, yeah, that's not good. You know, he's in the middle of a desert. What's he doing there? He traveled, uh, then he traveled to Jerusalem, then returned to teach in his hometown of Tarsus for an additional four years, Acts 9, verse 30. He was then recruited by Barnabas to come and teach at Antioch Church for an entire year. Finally, he and Barnabas escorted food and relief supplies to Jerusalem after a two-year famine had gripped the country, Acts 12, 25. Paul's consecration period saw him being taught by the Lord, teaching at the church in Antioch, traveling and meeting with various apostles and church. Now, he, we don't know that he was taught for the, by the Lord. So these are people adding things. Paul will say he has revelations, but he's not telling us in these specific time periods. When, so when you read things, you have to realize people make up fictions and myths. So we read a lot of myth in there, but there was some facts in there. Okay, so now uh, in a, uh, a book series and also a article online called Questioning Paul by C.W. Now, he's, he's more anti-Paul. So he maybe is looking at this a little more uh, negative, but you know, let's hear, hear let's hear all sides and see what we're going to find out. The timeline he provides in Galatians, delineating the number of and I and I think he's actually a very serious writer, and I, I I wouldn't put him in here if I didn't think you should consider him. Delineating the number of years which transpired between his conversion and the Jerusalem summit is too great. So what he's going to say is the years compute out to 19, so something's wrong in what Paul's telling us. And that's his point. So it's not really dogmatic or anything about his teachings. According to Paul's testimony in Acts 9, he spent a considerable period of time in Damascus amazing the locals while confusing the Jews after his conversion. Acts 9, verses 22 to 23. Let's assume this took the better part of a year. Then he claims to have gone off to Arabia for three years before returning to Damascus. Galatians 1, verses 17 to 18 only to be lowered down the wall in a basket, Acts 9, verses 24 to 25. And 2 Corinthians 11, 30, verses 32 to 33, where he claimed to be fleeing a government official under the Arabian king Aratas, who died in 40 Christian era. So that's another interesting fact. He's, he's being chased by the king of Arabia. So remember, he was in Arabia, and there's a king Aratas. So that maybe some hint of what's going on in the mystery years. He could have been in Arabia. He then went to Jerusalem to meet with Simon and Jacob. Jacob is James. That's in Galatians 1, verses 18 to 19. His travel on continues through Syria and Cilicia, a journey which collectively could have transpired over the course of a year, Galatians 1, verse 21. Although in Acts 9, Shaul, Paul, tells us they went to Caesarea, bypassing Syria, and then to Tarsus, Acts 9, verse 30. But then, but then out of the blue, this is what I would say, Paul tells us that he was summoned to the Jerusalem Ecclesia Church after the passage of another 14 years. 
Galatians 2, verse 1. So by putting it in sequence, he says that's a total of 19 years. So that really is, I think, the only person who's really said it correctly is this. He's taken all these events in sequence, merged Acts with Galatians and used fair approximations, and he's come up with 19 years of basically being away, not doing too many things. Okay, so I want to look at this a little deeper, right? Keep keep reviewing. Things are coming, things are percolating up. We're seeing there's too many years spent. It's a lot of years spent doing nothing that we know about and getting in trouble here and there uh, with Aratas from Arabia. Um, it's it's just very strange that his ministry is not really active for all these years, and that's admission. You know, basically he's either, you know, in, uh, contemplating or having revelations in the desert or whatever, but not spending a lot of time doing anything productive that we know of. So Paul in Galatians 1, verses 16 to 18 says, I did not immediately consult with anyone. So this is right after Damascus. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and then returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas or Kephas and remained with him 15 days. So this is another one of those confusing passages is he goes up to Jerusalem, then goes to Arabia, and then returned again to Damascus in Syria. Then after three years, went back to Jerusalem. And that's when he sees uh, Peter for in a period. And in that period, he was only in Jerusalem 15 days. So he's making it appeared these are these are good things to say that he spent very little time trying to get to know the the apostles so we're having a problem here here's somebody who should be spending time to go see the apostles and he's spending as little time as possible and he's actually extolling himself to these Galatians that I did I did not consult with anyone and I did not they imparted nothing to me he's doing everything he can to say they didn't help me and he's spending a lot of time doing basically what sounds like nothing so it's like very unproductive uh in terms of if he was given a ministry to preach to gentiles it's hard to see where that's happening for 14 or 19 years the other problem we have is that paul is a very bad historian apparently so when you he says i go nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. So this is why he, he's trying to make himself look like I don't depend on them. I don't need them. I don't care what they have to teach me. And he says that they imparted nothing to me. So as far as the Galatians know, he's all by himself getting all his revelations individually. But then when you look in the book of Acts, you see a contrary view. You know, in other words, Luke is an eyewitness to Paul saying things that are contrary to these statements to the Galatians. Galatians have to remember is the very first writing of Paul, 47 AD. There's no other writing before this one. This is it. What do we see in Acts 22, 17? We see that he went to go see the 12, but he then goes to the, the uh, temple and he prays and he's in an ecstasy and his Jesus appears to him in his ecstasy inside the temple. And that Jesus says, the 12 will not believe you met me. That's who, who his Jesus is referring to and Paul interprets it that way. And then he, Paul, uh, begs Jesus, you know, I want to go talk to them. I, I've killed people. I've killed Stephen. I'm sorry about abusing and arresting Christians. I want to go basically want to apologize. And Paul's Jesus tells him, nope, they're not going to believe you met me. Leave. Leave and go to the Gentiles. So that's inconsistent with this. I did not. Go, he says, I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me after Damascus, right? He didn't, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. False. He himself, this is his own words, in front of a group of hundreds of people at the temple where he's trying to defend himself, and they all want to charge him for having brought Trophimus into the sacred area in an uncircumcised state into the temple. And, and they were all angry at him. And so he's telling his whole story about how he became exposed to this Jesus that he had met on the road to Damascus. So he contradicts. Uh, himself and this one you can't say Luke is wrong this is not Luke being a bad historian he's there he's there he hears it and uh, it's it, there's got to be another explanation it's not that Luke's wrong so we, we're going to continue so let's read the passage so we don't just rely upon my paraphrases Acts 22 verses 17 21 Paul's giving this speech to hundreds of people literally at the temple at Pentecost who are all upset about Trophimus defiling the temple in an uncircumcised state going beyond the middle wall of separation all of these things are happening 
the Roman officers grab and save Paul from being killed by the crowd. And then Paul asks permission, can I talk to these people? And this is what Paul is saying to these hundreds of people. After he tells them about the Damascus experience, he then says this, when I had returned to Jerusalem, what did he say to Galatians? He didn't turn, return to Jerusalem. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance, an ecstasy, and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly. He's talking about Jesus appearing to him in his mind, because they will not accept your testimony about me. So his Jesus, his Jesus is saying, the twelve will not believe you really met me, so get out of here. As if they would hurt him or do some harm to him. It's what seems to be the implication of his Jesus to Paul. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he, Jesus, Paul's Jesus, said to him, Go, for I will send you away far to the Gentiles. Boom, Acts 22. So this is, remember, he's just had his Damascus experience. He's now, he took him probably two weeks to walk to Jerusalem. He goes to the temple. He then is praying in an ecstasy. His Jesus appears to him and then ultimately tells him, even though you walked all this way, this two-week walk, you didn't need to do that. I'm going to send you right back out to, to the Gentiles. And and Paul is begging to to repent to them. And he's saying, no, they're not going to believe you met me. As if the true Jesus could not convince the 12. As if the true Jesus couldn't communicate to them, maybe in some prayer. Couldn't com his, the true, the alleged Jesus couldn't find a way to convince the 12, maybe by appearing to them in the same way that he appeared to Paul. Like in a light standing right in front of them they, they, that they could recognize him. No, this Jesus can't do that. So this Jesus is what I call the powerless Jesus. And it's it's just, again, what I always said in my other episodes, this is the most I incredible thing that Paul doesn't see right through this. This is this is this can't be Jesus, because <laughs> the true Jesus can communicate. But this is what Paul is accepting, doesn't question it, doesn't think about it. But also it means it's inconsistent with Paul said in Galatians 1, 16, 18, and I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles. And in fact, he did want to go see the apostles. Now, the next question is, he was told not to go see the apostles by his Jesus. Does Paul obey his Jesus? No, he doesn't even obey his Jesus, showing you how di much disrespect he has for this Jesus, too, because he's going to go see them the next step, the next thing. Okay, and this account of Paul going to see the 12 in violation of his Jesus saying, go get out of here and don't go see the 12. They're not going to believe you met me. And in fact, what's interesting is the 12 never react to this presentation of Barnabas of Paul. But Paul is presented to the 12 by Barnabas. And it's like as if they, there, there's no reaction whatsoever. And that, that itself tells you a lot. So in Acts 9, 26 to 30, we read this. And when he had come to Jerusalem, when Paul had come to Jerusalem, Paul attempted to join the disciples. So the disciples are not the apostles. And they were all afraid of him. So that much is true that Jesus... Paul's Jesus was correct, but Paul's Jesus was really talking more about the 12, not the disciples. So these guys are afraid of him. So we don't know yet what the 12 are going to think. Let's see if it even is communicated to us. And then, and then it says, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. So they didn't believe Paul. So I hope these people had the Holy Spirit. Do you, ladies and gentlemen, think the disciples had the Holy Spirit? I think so. So maybe there should be some suggestion right there, right in front of us, that we should realize they could see it. But anyway, I digress. Verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. So this is what I think is going on here is Paul knows he can't actually present himself to the 12 because that would be directly disobeying Jesus. But if he had his friend Barnabas from Antioch do it for him, maybe his Jesus wouldn't be so upset with him. So that's the only thing I can rationalize why Paul did what he did. And uh, Barnabas declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas is get, telling a nice story that they'll like him. So he now, now there's no reaction. This is where the reaction should have come. And in verse 28, we don't hear anything about the reaction. We're just going to it's just going to go. So he, Paul, went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. That's it. We don't know if the 12 liked him, didn't like him, if they were getting along, had a good time, shared any stories, nothing, zero. And he, Paul, spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. Now, that's interesting. Hellenist means, uh, uh, usually, it means Jews who are trying to Hellenize people, make them more like the Greeks. <laughs> 
So he is preaching and disputing against the Hellenists, when instead that's Paul's actual point of view. He's a Hellenist, but Luke doesn't seem to know that. And this is the first clue, by the way, if anyone wants to know, does Luke have any clue that Paul is... Uh, is himself a Hellenist? No, because he thinks he's disputing against Hellenists. And this is what Paul was doing. He's giving a false impression of who he really was at this time, unless this was where he really was. That's always a possibility. He could have been a uh, anti-Hellenist then. He's going to become an extreme Hellenist later. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers le learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So now he's going to head to Tarsus. So, so this is this is all we're, we're piecing things together. He's now heading to Tarsus, and and we're and we're not going to see from him or hear from him for for over a decade. It looks like. Okay, so now Paul goes away to Arabia. Okay, now you're gonna. Some people say, well, he was only there three years. No, because he's gone for 14 years, and and he's going to say this at the end of Galatians. The only thing that makes sense is this period in Arabia is 14 years because then he's going to say um, he returned to Damascus. So 14 years in Arabia, returns to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. So this isn't the conference yet, but you got to get you got to get closer to that. So you got to you got to bleed out these 14 years. Maybe what it is, the 14 years are in Arabia, or or maybe, uh, and then there's a three years appended, or maybe the three years is included within the Arabia time. Anyway, it's confusing, or you have to accept he's talking about 19 total years, as, defer, as CW says above. Okay, so what a lot of people say is Acts 15, which is the Jerusalem conference, represents, represents either 14 or 17 years from Paul's Damascus experience. And again, ladies and gentlemen, there's virtually no activity of Paul. There's no, no history of what he's doing in his time period, primarily. And it's called his mystery period. Okay, so here is the passage where we hear about the 14 years. And it's hard to figure out what he's saying, or at least that's how many people try to interpret it. It's too, it's too hard to figure out. I'd say CW is just taking it at face value. So let's read it and, and see if we can figure it out. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation. And meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Okay, let's just contemplate here. So what Paul is saying is it took him 14 years to try to find out if the gospel he's preaching is valid well that would suggest to me that he hasn't been doing any preaching of any gospel for all this time even though he tells us that his right after he came from damascus he went to the he went to the temple of jerusalem had his ecstasy his prayer and in that prayer his jesus shows up in his dream or in his head and tells him you know the 12 won't believe you met me i'm sending you back out to the gentiles leave and preach to the gentiles and yet it's at least 14 years, if not 17. There's that three years period he mentioned earlier in Galatians. So it seems to be 14 or 17 years later with a, with a, a small hiatus in, the, in a small period of time, maybe three years after, after the event, he did go back to see um, Peter and maybe somebody else in a two-week period. That seems to be what he's saying. But this is a long, long period of time to not go get confirmation of what you're teaching or what you're learning. And I presented them to the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. Now, did he really present that to them? That's what he's telling the Galatians. He's trying to make them think he has their authority. So notice who he's looking to get the Galatians to accept, or what he's trying to get the Galatians to accept is that the 12 have approved me, so I can talk to you. So these are people who've already been pre pre uh, prepared by the true 12, and they know the 12, but they don't know Paul. 
So the Galatians is kind of his new ground, and he's trying to explain uh, how come he's approved. So he met privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. So that re- to, to see if I had not been running my race in vain. So here's another thing. If he's getting revelations in the desert or wherever he's getting it from, and it's Jesus Christ speaking to him in his brain normally, like more ecstasy is, why would you have any doubt? Why, why do you need to have confirmation at all? Why don't you tell the 12, hey, I've been seeing Jesus in my dreams and visions and whatever they are, and this is what the truth is, and you guys have to listen to me. But he's not acting like he has any sense of authority in anything he's been experiencing. Do, do you see that? I think this is really, by studying the timeline, you actually, certain things just drop out. And this is after he's been at it 14 years. And now Galatians, this is his first epistle, right? 47 AD. So um, anyway, it's just, it's just it's strange that he has not sought approval till now, and he needs approval. Why does he need approval if he's got this really dynamite connection to the, to the Lord Jesus? And why is his Jesus appearing to him in visions and dreams and all this kind of stuff? That just doesn't. Jesus, you know, he's not doing that with the 12. <laughs> he's not appearing in vision and dreams. Even when Peter has a, a dream, he's not saying, I see Jesus. Now, now you got to know what people say. Well, what about John the ba- John the God, uh, John the Apostle? Well, he was taken up into the into heaven physically by Jesus, and he's not claiming it's a vision or a dream. He's up there and he's he's experiencing it in real time. That's how he that's how he was experiencing it, uh, although he was seeing visions, I think, too uh, before that. Um, anyway, but the point is this: this is Paul, and we're trying to figure out what's going on with him, and so he is. You can also see he's now very clearly in the has a gospel of against the law. And of course, just have to read the book of Galatians to know that. But he's already setting it up that there's false believers. So are they people who don't really believe, or they don't believe in your gospel? So he seems to be calling people who don't accept his gospel, which is a lawless one, you know, avowedly. I mean, in Galatians, he's going to say that if you keep Sabbath, you're damned, you're you're cursed. I mean, literally, and then you're obeying those who are no gods and who are weak and beggarly elements. I mean, and he tells, he teaches in Galatians that God did not give the law at Sinai. He says that was given by angels through a mediator Moses. He also says that God at Sinai could not abridge or change the covenant that was given to Abraham beforehand. So he basically says the entire Sinai covenant added these conditions that are unlawful. And he said, you know, I, I have to give you an example, he says, uh, a human contract, once it's entered into, you can't come with another contract and replace it, which, by the way, was wrong, even as a matter of human law. I have a video on that. Why? Why? How can God be restricted by human law anyway? God can do whatever he wants. If he wants to add something, he can add anything he wants at any time. Anyway, but my point is this, is he has no explanation of where he's, why he's been out there in the desert so long and he still doesn't know his gospel is confirmed by the 12. He's never gone there before to get confirmed in any way. And he claims he he did. That's right. But he doesn't tell you who. He doesn't use a name, which is kind of unreliable. Okay, so let's see if we got anything else. Okay, I just want to give another approach. So I, I think, well, by the way, when I do study, I try to see all points of view. I don't try to read people who I just agree with. And I think that's something that we all need to know that we we should read things we don't think we're going to agree with. So that's how you learn. And then you read everything from all different perspectives. Because there's sometimes there's 10. In this situation, there's like 10 different views of what's going on. And it's because it's such an open-ended thing. So extracting some valuable information takes time and effort. First of all, let's look at what Arabia is on the right side. So you can see there the Napatean kingdom near Petra. And it's not far from Jerusalem, actually, if you see. So you have the Syrian desert to the right, a little north. You have Jerusalem ahead of that. So on the uh, so south, somewhat uh, east of Israel and Jerusalem, is this Arabian kingdom and the Red Sea and all that. So it's kind of different than what I would have thought. You know, I I don't know why. But and there's Mecca if you keep going. So this is an area that's, you know, and then uh, what's on the other side? Then Sinai and then Ethiopia across the Red Sea. Okay, so this is very, very useful to get yourself situated. So let's see what JesusWalk.com has to say. What is Saul doing in the desert of Arabia? 
One might compare his withdrawal to the desert with Jesus, 40 days in the desert, to be tempted or tested by the devil. Some imagine that Paul is preaching to the Arab tribes he meets, which might explain why King Aretas tries to kill him in Damascus. Others imagine that he has gone to Mount Sinai, Galatians 4.25, to meet God in the tradition of Moses at Elijah. I don't think so. <laughs> That's the last place he wants to go. Remember, he's condemned that uh, that uh, what happened at Sinai. He, he basically says Moses, it was illicit and in, in, improper for God to change the law or try to change the law or add to the law that had already been given to Abraham through a covenant. So he's basically saying God didn't have, a, did not. he literally says this in Galatians, God did not have a right to uh, give any more law because he, he gave the promise of salvation by just faith alone to Gen uh, to uh, to G um, Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 6. Completely misread that. We have a series on that. Genesis 17 is when the covenant happens, not in 15. 15, 6 is not even a promise of salvation by faith alone. It's just seen, It simply says Abraham believed God and counted it to God as righteousness. That's what it says. Believe. So he's saying he, Abraham, counted it to God as righteousness to promise him in old age to have a child. That's all that is. Paul made a whole doctrine on that. But anyway, the point is this, is that we are trying to focus in on what's what's really going on here. But this author says we just don't know what's going on. you know. So we can try to fill it in with all kinds of imagination. And then that's the correct answer. We don't know what's going on. Uh, but he need not have gone far from Damascus to be in Arabia, the Nepotean kingdom. And that's useful to know. It's not, it's it's really right outside of all these areas that we're talking about. Um, but he need not have gone far to be in Arabia, the Nepotean kingdom. I expect that this is a time of talking with God, of clarifying God's call and receiving revelation, which will form the basis of his teaching for the rest of his life. So let's say, let's just test his hypothesis. What did Paul just say? After 14 years, he goes to see the tw see someone at Jerusalem to have confirmation. He doesn't say who, because he's afraid he might have run the race and, and been running the wrong way. Boy, he, these revelations must not be as special as he makes them sound in Second Corinthians 12, because if he's really having true revelations and he's truly up in the third heaven and truly convinced of what's going on, he doesn't act very much like it, does he? I got to go to Jerusalem to get confirmed after 14 years. Why didn't you start with them from the beginning? If this is how uncertain it was that you were you were being trained by visions and dreams, which is really an unreliable way to be trained. The best way was to have been a disciple of Jesus. And if you can't, if Jesus has been resurrected and in his heaven, what's the next best way? Get trained by the 12 apostles. But being trained by vision and dreams? No, that's not the way to be educated, Paul. So he went all the wrong way. So I think we've, uh, let me see if I got one more slide. Okay, and this is our final slide. And I'm just going to read this. This is from the JesusWalk.com, a pro Paul webpage. That's about his Arabia visit. And he says this, a key insight is found in Paul's letter to the Galatians. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 to 12. Now, let me just comment. He didn't see this but or recognize this. But in Galatians 2, he's saying, I went up to Jerusalem many years later to see if I had, uh, you know, run uh, in the wrong direction. I wanted to be verified that, you know, I'm on the right path. So he's he's not sure of himself when he gets to the 12. And that's only a chapter after this where he's saying he's he's uh, what the gospel I have was not made my man. It's, I did not receive it from any man, and nor was I taught it. Yet, then why are you asking the twelve for their opinion? Are you just wasting their time? If they'd said, uh, you know, you don't have the right gospel, would you have listened? And so the other thing is, we don't even know this conference took place, or whether he communicated his full gospel. The 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 laws abrogated the law. Of Moses was not given to Moses by God. That's in Galatians 2, the same book, the same epistle we're reading. He says God did not bring, did not, did not communicate the Ten Commandments to Moses. Instead, it was angels. This is in Galatians chapter 3 and 4. You can see he's, and then he says there are no gods. Why do you want to be in bondage to those who are no gods? You don't have to observe Sabbath. You know, and why do you want to be subject to the weak and beggarly elements, which in Greek thought and even Jewish thought elements meant the angels. So he's he's totally 
uh, has a, 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 a view that I can't imagine the 12 apostles approved, it's just in Galatians alone. And this is his first epistle. Anyway, so let's uh, let's read the rest of this from JesusWalk.com. Paul's authority is Jesus Christ, revealing himself to him personally. Listen to this. And man's traditions, even traditions of the mother church in Jerusalem, aren't his primary source. So imagine this. He's This is a guy who's conceding that even though the apostles have the Gospels of Jesus, Matthew was written in 38 AD, three years after the crucifixion. It's sitting in a library in Caesarea. It's being copied. It's being circulated. People are talking. People are quoting. There's there's all the resources to find out about Jesus, and Paul doesn't want to know anything about it. And he's going to go get his revelations out in a sandy desert in the middle of nowhere, of Arabia. I mean, it's just something isn't right in Denmark. And yet this is what Christianity today, we are told, we have to rely upon this person to bring us Christianity to us, even though he didn't spend any time with the apostles to learn from them. He was he was doing his own thing out in Arabia for 14 years or whatever it was, just communing and getting re- revelations. And uh, But even then, he wasn't sure of himself, and he has to go ask the 12, what do you think of this? Supposedly, that's what he's telling us. So even if I were a Galatian, I would say, well, I thought you said this was not given by man, and you know, you didn't receive it from a man. So why are you even asking the approval of men? You know, what, 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 why are they important to you? <laughs> so he's, he's contradicts himself. You know, it doesn't make sense to say at one moment I have complete revelation from God. Could you imagine Jeremiah saying, I got all these revelations from God and then turning around to some, somebody else who's not a prophet like you, you, you're getting revelations. The other people just remember the words of Jesus when he was here. They're not prophesying. P- Peter's not prophesying. And, you know, the, the exception is John. He would have prophecy with the book of Revelation. But everybody else is just teaching the words and commandments of Jesus from what they remembered and recording it by the Holy Spirit. That's what they're doing. That's their job. They're messengers. But you're something else. You're literally saying you're having all these visions, Paul, out in the desert, and, and they're new revelations that were never given by Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, you told us in Second Corinthians 12, that you can't tell us any of anything you hear. It's you were told it's illicit, illegal for you to ever say anything you heard in the third heaven. But you can summarize it. You can, you can just somehow reflect it without ever quoting it, which is what you're supposed, what we're allegedly supposed to believe about you. Anyway, uh, I hope this helped us get a better idea of who Paul is, the problems of Paul. Uh, and, and why he will always be a problem. He's got too many gaps and inconsistencies and doesn't, you know, doesn't say things that are coherent with the other things he says. They don't fit and line up. And unfortunately, I don't think it's, I don't think it means there's been tampering. I think it's literally the way he thinks because this inconsistency in Galatians is right <laughs> within one chapter of the other. You know, you're having revelations over here in chapter one, but in Revelations, uh, in Galatians two, you got to get approval many, many years later from the 12 and make sure you haven't run, you know, needlessly in the wrong direction. I mean, either you're having revelations or you're not. <laughs> You don't need, nobody's going to be able to confirm them or not. It's whether you're having them or not, you got to know. So apparently he's not that sure. Okay, God bless. I hope this helps everybody. Ciao, bye.